Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Danny, a very grateful recovered alcoholic. Hey, Danny. Uh, it's absolutely uh, beyond an honor and a privilege to be here tonight. Uh, it's an honor to be asked to speak anywhere in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, this particular meeting has a special place in my heart. Um, I've been listening to the podcast for about four years. Before I moved to Florida, I started listening to the podcast. And um, a lot of the people that, that speak here and do the Step Series are my mentors and help shape my recovery. And um, kind of a shock to be asked to, to speak here. Um, if you came here for Peter tonight, sorry. <laughs> no. No. Hopefully, ho- hopefully he doesn't hunt me down and kill me when he gets back. Um, you know, but I've been s- since a couple months ago, a month or so ago. You know, when Mike when Mike Chase asked me, um, you know, I answered, at f- first I thought I was going to be sick. Um, I, I was I was I was absolutely floored and I was honored, but uh, you know I thought I was going to be sick, and uh, you know I pray for God to keep me busy and uh, to keep this off my mind between then and now, and gratefully right up until I got off Broward Boulevard, that worked, and uh, and then and then it worked again when I came in right up until the two minutes of silence, and I had about 187 conversations with myself during that. <laughs> Wasn't much meditation going on. Um, no, but it's absolutely an honor, and um, no, I just hope that I can stay out of God's way tonight, and I'll do my best to do that with his guidance. Hopefully that'll be possible. Uh, you know, I'd like to thank Mike Chase and, and, and the group for inviting me to be here. Very excited, very nervous. Not only do I get to be up on the stage, I got to be up on a, a, on a stinking, like, platform on top of the stage. <laughs> Spotlights, like... <laughs> I feel like I'm under interrogation. <laughs> And I'm at a podium. Innocent. I swear. Um, so I'll do my best to share what I was like and what happened to me, my, uh, well, my surrender and the transformation through the 12 steps and the grace of God and what I'm like today living life in the sunlight of the Spirit. It'd be much easier to do what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. It was fun. It sucked. I burned my life to the ground, came to AA, life got better. Have a good night. <laughs> but, uh, but I'll try to stick to what I was like. Um, I was born at a young age. <sighs> <sighs> these, these jokes are for me, not for you. <laughs> um, you know, I believe I was a little freeze-dried alcoholic. Um, it, I just needed to add alcohol in, into my body for, for it to be exposed. And... Um, I started drinking. I'm not good with numbers. I would have took notes if I'd have known I was going to have to tell people. I, I'm absolutely amazed by people that can describe that first drink like like it was yesterday. Like I don't even remember not drinking. I don't. I don't ever remember not drinking. I know it happened. I can look back at the patterns, the stuff that started happening in my life. You know, my behaviors in school. You know what I mean? Th- you know, grades slipping, my priorities changing. So it was somewhere around like fourth, fifth grade, I think that's like around 10. That's the best I can gather by going backwards from graduation by age. So somewhere around like 10, and um, I began doing everything else at the same time. Uh, But uh, my story story begins and ends with alcohol. Um, If you put a month's supply of anything else in front of me, like I'd make it disappear over the weekend. Um, But the great news about drugs for me is they helped to expose my alcoholism to me. Um, because the consequences that alcohol gave me seemed like an acceptable price to pay. You know, there were certain lines I didn't need to cross for alcohol because I did well financially in my life. Um, you know, drugs helped to, helped to make that a problem, so I had to cross some lines that I wasn't comfortable crossing. And, and it wasn't until I removed those from the equation through treatment you know, that... that and having had learned what I had learned while I was there, I was fortunate that uh, you know my counselor was a big book thumper, and um, 
you know, once I removed the drugs from the equation and I was left with just the alcohol, having learned what I had learned, you know what I mean, it became quite clear to me and I could start to see you know, the history of my life more clearly and, and see, you know what I mean, just exactly how much destruction alcohol had done to me as a person, which in turn I did to my life and to everybody's life that I came in contact with. Um, from that age of around 10, living life forward and understanding backwards, understanding the disease of alcoholism, and, and what it does to me as a person and the spiritual malady that I suffer from, I can see that every single decision I made in my life from the, from the day I picked up a drink was made by alcohol. My alcoholism made every decision. Oh. Oh. I came to learn that I was driven by those hundred forms of fear. Oh. I thought I wasn't afraid of anything. I thought I was afraid of losing my son. And I thought I was afraid of being sober. It turns out there's absolutely nothing that I'm not afraid of. And I'm paralyzed with the fear of what I think, what, what I think other people think of me. And I made every decision of my life based on that. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on my, on, on my actual, like, the story of my life. You know, I want to focus more on, um, you know what I mean, the spiritual malady in my life, you know, the powerlessness of my life, the unmanageability inside of me, and, and, and how that brought me to my knees. Um, but I will give just a brief background. Um, I grew up uh, an only child, and um, you know I never suffered, suffered from a lack of love. Like my parents, I don't ever remember them being together. I think they were. They were when I was first born, uh, but I don't remember remember them being together. My mother was an absolute saint. Um, I didn't suffer from, suffer from a lack of love. I was her world, and my father was, you know, debatably one of us. Um, and, you know, he wasn't able to be present in my life all that often, but when he was, I was his whole world. So I didn't suffer from a lack of love. You know, I had no idea that my childhood wasn't, you know, that it was a dysfunctional childhood, you know, that my mother worked three jobs to keep a roof over our head, and so that I, she wasn't around much. You know, all I remember is that she was amazing and loving. You know, my father not being there, my father being in and out of prison, my father being, you know, getting in fights on the side of the road with me sitting in the car waiting for me to get back in the car. You know, all, all, all the the drug deals that I was, you know, with him when he was doing and stuff that happened and, um, you know, a lot of stuff that, you know, that I was witness to that I really wasn't aware of at the time because I was just with my dad, my hero. You know, so there was no lack of love in my life, yet I didn't feel loved. I didn't feel worthy of love. I, I, as far back as I can remember, which isn't very far because most of my life's a blur, uh, I really don't remember much of being a child. Um, I don't know if that's because I started drinking at like 10, and so whatever before that got blurred out. Like, you know, I hear people talking about their childhood. Like, I just don't have a recollection. You know, I have bits and pieces. Most of my life is secondhand knowledge. Uh, I spent most of my life in a blackout. If it wasn't a blackout, I was in a gray out, or I was just going 100 miles an hour, and, and, and I, I, I couldn't notice what was going on. Um, I did very well in school. Um, I was a little mama's boy, and um, apparently I found out like about a year ago that I told my mother I hated her because of that. And um, that, that probably broke her heart. You know, but I didn't know. I couldn't see past myself to see anybody else. Um, you know, so I tried to do everything I could to dispel that image to anybody else that I was a mama's boy. You know, so I started hanging out with older kids. And I started, you know what I mean, doing crazy things and getting in a lot of fights at a young age. And uh, my schoolwork suffered a little bit, but, you know, not anything to do with my application of, of anything, any gift that God had given me. Like, I, you know, I was book smart. You know, and I excelled in school, and I quickly came to find out, like, you know, manipulation came easy to me. You know, and I found out real quick, if I do well in school, and I'm screwing up outside of school, like, no big deal, because I'm doing well in school. And so I always excelled at school. You know, I always was in advanced classes. I, I, I had a, a full academic scholarship, a free ride to college. And, uh, you know, the summer after, the summer after I graduated, you know, I got a job. I, I grew up commercial fishing. My father was a fisherman and, uh, I grew up around, uh, commercial fishing boats. And I got a job that year when I graduated high school working on a commercial fishing boat. And, um, the captain would bring, we'd go for anywhere from two to five days. You know, and he would bring as much cocaine as you could do, as much pot as you could smoke, and as much booze as you could drink on the boat for the trip. 
And then at the end of the trip, you know, you get a check for a couple grand. And, you know, I'm 18 years old. Like, I was working at the boat yard. Uh, I was, you know, making five or six hundred bucks a week. And, like, I couldn't make it through Saturday without running out of money because every, all the partying I was doing. So now I'm working with, on this boat, and he's providing everything I need to party around the clock. And I'm getting a check for a couple grand at the, at the end of the trip. And uh, so I decided, master plan, like, I'm a real smart guy. Like, what kind of an idiot would go to college when I have this going on in my life? And so I, I called the college, and I said, yeah, um, I just want to let you know, like, I'm not coming. Like, you can give that scholarship to somebody that will make use of it. And the lady on the other end of the phone was like, I'm like, hello, hello. And she was like, do you have any idea with your, what you're passing up right now? And I just said yes, because it was clear that she was kind of taken aback by this. You know, but what was going through my head was, do you have any idea what I have going on in my life right now? Like, why would I go to college? Like, it seemed like a logical choice to me, you know, because booze and drugs were running my life. You know, and every relationship I ever had, every friendship I ever had, every job I ever had, every place I ever lived was dictated by that. You know, my life was one big opportunity, but alcoholism did not allow me to capitalize on any of that. You know, so a couple months later, I flipped my car, got my first drunk driving, and uh, then went that job. So now I'm unemployed. I don't have a vehicle. Now, being an only child, I watched a lot of movies growing up. And, uh, you know, I saw people in these movies all the time, like they're in trouble with the law. Like they get to go in the military or go to jail. And I had no idea what the penalties was for drunk driving. But, like, I was pretty sure I was going to prison for the rest of my life. You know, I had been in trouble with the law a bunch of times already. I already had, like, a record. You know, I kept continuing out of findings, you know what I mean, up the yin-yang. And I'm like, you know, my luck's run out. Like, I'm screwed. You know, uh, so I'm like, this will keep me from losing my license for a very long, and it'll keep me from getting more, more trouble with the law. And so I was like, what if I go in the Navy? I like the ocean. I like boats. So they were like, sure. So I, I apparently I wasn't going to jail anyway, but I didn't go to jail. And so I went to boot camp, which had to get put off a couple times because I had a problem. I did scored really well on the ASVAB test. And then they had me take another test, and I scored really well on that. And so they entered me into the nuclear program. And um, But I had a real hard time passing another test, urinalysis. <laughs> and so I had delayed entry. And, uh, you know, so I went into boot camp, and, you know, I quickly found out how to get out of stuff. You know, I found out like the only thing, I found out exactly which bunk that I could spend time in where they couldn't see me during during PT and I could just slide under my bed on the floor and not do the the push ups or anything and you know, I was book smart, so I could test I could use the books and I could test all the tests out without being in the classes. And then like, you know, we would go to filing down and I would be like, Oh, like I'll be right there and like I gotta go to the bathroom real quick and like I would slide into the empty unit and spend the time there. And uh you know, so life wasn't getting any better, and I thought the military was going to give me some discipline and help me to grow up, grow up and be a man. And uh, you know, I didn't make any use of it, and I uh, got out of boot camp, quickly escalated, quickly promoted to E4, third class petty officer after A school. Uh, graduated very well from A school, and uh, then we had a little break, and then they go to nuclear power school. Now I was going, to, I'm a smart guy, but these kids that I was in there with, they're like graduating college at 18 and stuff, you know. It's no offense to anybody that smart, but they're a little nerdy. Right? <clears throat> I'm kind of a street guy, and you have to log in, lo log in time in the classroom. So, you know, I go to them and say, like, listen, like, you know, I went to the bathroom. If anybody comes looking for me, I either went to the bathroom, and if they come back, I went to my, I went to back to the barracks real quick. But as far as you're concerned, I was here the whole day, and then I got in the car and went to Cocoa Beach and drank on the beach all day. And we got to power school, and now all of a sudden I had to do that check-in for 45 hours a week outside of the 40 hours of class because it was all classified material. And they gave us a stack of books as high, and it took me all of about 0.6 seconds to calculate without, without thinking about it, unconsciously, to calculate that that wasn't going to leave time for drinking. 
And so I went right to my chief and I said, I'm all set with this. Like, you know, send me to the, you know, I'll just be a conventional machinist, mate. And he said, it's not that easy to get out of the nuclear program. And I'm like, then get me out of the Navy. You know, and uh, I didn't want to get a dishonorable discharge. So I didn't want a bad conduct. I didn't have anybody dying in my family. Um, I, didn't, I didn't want to get the psych discharge. I didn't want to embarrass my family. You know, so this was back in the early 90s. And then, I don't know, I, think, I don't remember who was president. I don't even barely know who was president today. Um, <laughs> but they had this don't ask, don't tell thing. And, uh, you know, so I was engaged to this girl on base, and we used to have dinner with my chief and his wife, and my chief used to see me with several other women during the course of the week at the enlistments club. He knew me pretty well. He knew what I was about. He knew the type of guy I was. And uh, I said, well, what about the don't ask, don't tell? And he said, well, that would be fine, but you need to be gay. And I went, well, I'm gay. <laughs> and he said, he said, but myself and everybody else on this base knows you very well and knows your antics, and, like, that's not going to fly. So I said, well, you know, being around all these guys all the time is really giving me some weird thoughts. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, you're going to have to stand up and cap this mask, and there was probably it, more people that are in here right now. And you're going to have to say this. And I'm, that's fine with me. It's honorable discharge, right? General under honorable conditions, good enough. I collect unemployment when I go home. He said, yeah. I said, good, let's do this. <clears throat> you know, so one more opportunity at a good future that I'd thrown away because it was standing between me and the booze. And I didn't know this at the time. I convinced myself instantly what I told myself was not, this won't leave any time for drinking. What I told myself was, I'm not smart enough for that. Mm -hmm. Because this disease, I, I suffer from delusion. You know what I mean? I'm driven by not only these hundred forms of fear, but these hundred, hundred forms of delusion. You know what I mean? I would delude myself in, in, into anything that I needed to. This disease would convince me of anything it needed to for it to be my primary purpose in life, to serve this disease, because I was a slave to it. You know, and so uh, you know, I went home and thus began a series of geographical cures, um, because clearly, like, I just needed a fresh start, you know, and, you know, Massachusetts sucks. Winter's cold, it's miserable, like, I need to get out of this godforsaken state, and, um, you know, if you couldn't tell, I like the sun, I like the beach, um, so why not come to Florida? Because I was in Florida for boot camp and in school in Orlando, and I liked being at the beach and drinking on the beach. So I came back down and moved to Cocoa Beach and left with somebody's product in the middle of the night. And uh, I had to move back home. And I came back down and went to Daytona Beach. And I did the same thing to somebody there. And I went back home. And then I came down to this area for a short period of time. I never lasted more than like two months. I had to leave under the cover at night. So clearly it was Florida. People are just, you know, not the, the people in Florida just don't get me. Uh, so I, I made a quick journey out to Hermosa Beach, California, and um, you know I didn't fit in very well out there, and so I came back home again, and then I was like, maybe I'm not destined to be at the beach. So I chased some girl to the mountains in West Virginia, <laughs> turned her life upside down, and then um, her father was going to feed me to the pigs on his pig farm. And so, like, you know, I jumped out of the car at a stop sign and, and hopped a bus back home. And there I was again. And so I came to the conclusion that the, the continent was a problem. <laughs> you know, it was clearly a problem because, like, it, you know, everywhere I go, like, I've run into these problems. Like, you know what I mean? And, and everywhere I go, it just seems like everybody is so incompetent. And, and people have no idea who I think I am. And so I decide, like, well, you know what it is. Florida is just not enough of paradise. So Hawaii looks really good. So and Kauai, it's a real quaint island. It doesn't have the craziness of the big islands. Like, you know, they, they filmed the Jurassic Park there. And, uh, 
you know, I didn't believe in God, but, so, but, but it seemed destiny because, like, I was surfing in the middle of January in Situate Harbor, outside of Situate Harbor at Peggotty Beach. You know, the water's, like, you know, 30 degrees, and I got a quarter instinct wetsuit on, and, like, you know, my head hurts, I'm so cold. And I met this guy, and we went back to do a few bong hits and have some lunch at his house. And uh, he had a message on his machine from somebody in Hawaii, and I had just been saying, maybe I should move to Hawaii. So I was like, well, this is destiny. And he said, well, Hurricane Aniki just wiped out the island. I could probably get you some work. And I was like, let's do this. You know, and uh, so I bought a plane ticket, and uh, I went to Hawaii. And I landed on the island with a friend of mine, and we each had a surfboard, a backpack, and we had 90, 90-something dollars between us. It was like $93. And uh, the people there were really nice. You know, we didn't get out of the parking lot. We, from the from the airport, and some guy like pulled over, rearranged his mini minivan so we could get the surfboards in the back, and uh, you know, just so happening, you know what I mean? He got a little bit of Maui Waui that we could buy, so now we were left with forty dollars. <laughs> so we had him stop at the liquor store, like you know, all we need is enough money for food because we're gonna get a job, and you know, so then you stopped at the liquor store, got a rack of beers, drop us off at the nearest surf break. It's like a sheet of glass, no waves. Still paddle out there. We're in Hawaii. Like, this is great. And uh, started to ask somebody where was a good place to pitch, set up camp and pitch a tent. They told us. So we started walking. Walked about 100 yards. This pickup truck picked us up. And he was like, you guys need a job? Gave us a job. So, like, I was, off the, I was off the airplane for, like, you know, four hours. And I had a job making $20 an hour cash. Turned out that the guy who hired us grew his own Maui Waui. <laughs> And he grew mushrooms in his garden. So I was like, I have arrived. You know, <laughs> this is great. And uh, I, I, I managed to stay there for about 13 months. And, um, and apparently, so my mother claims, I called her, terrified for my life, once again, that somebody was trying to gonna kill me. And I uh, come to find out, like, two years later, like, I robbed some grower of just, you know, he had plenty. I just took a couple handfuls, I guess. But, uh, you know, and so I left the big island, and I don't remember. I, I totaled the car that me and my buddy bought together. Um, I trashed the house. I robbed our grower friend, cleaned out our, our joint bank account, and called my mother for a plane ticket. And I was on Kauai, so I had to fly over to the big island. And from there, I had to fly to L.A., which is like a six-hour flight. And I came to, and I'm like, where the hell am I? And so I look around, and I assess, God bless you. And I assess the situation, and I'm at LAX. I'm like, how the hell did I get here? Like, I, I didn't remember leaving the island. Never mind staying overnight in the next island to wait for the plane in the morning and fly in there. And, uh, you know, that's how every episode of my life ended was like any good tough guy, barroom brawler, drug dealer, calling my mother in tears at two o'clock in the morning, begging her for a plane ticket, you know, and uh, and then asking my dad if I could go live on the boat again because I wasn't welcome to live in anybody's house anymore, and um, you know, so, so that's pretty much the story of my life. So power, you know, powerlessness in my life. Um, well, a couple of those things illustrate the powerlessness of my life. A couple of those stories illustrate the unmanageability within me. Um, that restless, irritable, and discontent. Like not being able to find my place in life. Got, started my own business. Went back into fishing for a while. Got away from that. Started my own business. And um, I just couldn't find happiness. Everything that I could find that would make me feel almost quickly became the wrong decision. You know, I was making a ton of money. You know, I had the woman that I thought was the woman of my dreams. And uh, I must have been like in a blackout when I went into that dream because uh, you know, didn't didn't really turn out to be that, uh, but I don't th I don't think she changed. I don't think she changed. No. she was amazing. She's a psychopath, but she was amazing. But I loved her. I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her. I you know 
I got her to say yes three times. I brought her three rings. Thank God she never married me. Um, but she was a woman of my dreams, and like my life was, she was everything in my life. And like I worshipped her. And then, you know, six months later, she, you know, was a little guy. That's, that's right. She was nothing but a nagging bitch, you know. And and nothing had changed. You know, she wanted me to keep coming home for dinner. You know, and so I'm at the bar and she's blowing my cell phone up, which wasn't this little flat smartphone at the time. And like, so like I would ignore it, but then it would butt dial her and. She would listen to what was going on and then quiz me when I, when I did show up and I would fail. <clears throat> and she started calling the bar. I'd be like, I'm not here. <laughs> and then she would walk in the door. And, but she would call me. I would talk to her when I was leaving work. And when I left work, I was, I'd get a 12 pack for the ride home. I decided how far jobs were from the house by like, you know, that's a six pack ride, that's a 12 pack ride, that's an 18 pack ride. You know, we gave, I gave directions to people like, you know, that little red package store we call the liquor stores packies. You know, the little red packy, you know what I mean? Like, you, it's like about a quarter mile past there, like right, right by Mulligan's, that bar on the corner with the green sign, like you boom down there. Everything was, everything in my life was associated with it. And, uh, you know, I would leave the job site and, you know, well, this is a you know, 12 pack ride home. It's about 45 minutes, 12 pack. Like, I'll stop, play a couple games of Keno, have another four or five beers, shoot a couple games of pool. Like, it's 1.30 now. Like, I can be home for dinner. What time do you think I'll be home? Now, I'll probably be home around 5.36. And I meant it. I meant it because I, because I wanted to spend time with her. No, but I didn't understand about this phenomenon of craving. No, I thought I just kept changing my mind. No, and I would drink that 12 pack on the ride over, on the ride home. No, and then I would get off the highway and it's like three miles to the bar that I'm going to. And I had to stop at the packy right off the exit to get beers to get to the, to get to the thing. And I just thought I was thirsty because I'd been working hard all day. Like I didn't understand about this phenomenon of craving. You know, that, that it was demanding more and the more that I drank, the thirstier I was getting for it. And so I would go there and I would have set out to have four or five, maybe six, a couple shots, and a couple games of bull, a couple games of keno, and I, you know, I'm gonna be home, I'm gonna be home five, six thirty at the latest. You know what I mean? She, she won't be, she didn't won't be ready at five thirty anyway. So I, I, I got an extra hour. And then she would start calling me about seven, seven thirty. And like as soon as I saw that phone, I would be like sick to my stomach. You know, because I knew I promised her I'd be there, and I wanted to be. You know, but it was Brian's round. I didn't want to be rude. You know, and that, but that, see, that's what I tell myself. I tell myself, like, it's Brian's round. I don't want to be rude. You know? Oh, well, I was leaving, but they just, you know, they brought one to me. It's already open. I don't want it to go to waste. You know? And, um... So then I would say to myself, like, well, maybe, you know, if she wasn't calling me, harassing me, like, I might want to go home. You know? And she would tell me, like, that I drink too much. That I do too much other stuff. That I don't care about anything but drinking. I don't care about her. I don't love her. And he used to rip my heart out. Because it wasn't true. That wasn't my heart. In my heart, she was my world. You know? And I saw my actions prove indifferent. She helped me to see that. But I saw my actions prove indifferent. And it used to kill me. And I couldn't understand why. Couldn't understand. I could drink at home. But I couldn't stop drinking long enough to go drink some, to go home to drink. And so I would say, like, well, maybe if you weren't calling me, harass me so much, I might want to come home. Why would I want to come home to you? You're, you, you, you're leaving me nasty messages. And I'm not even home yet. Why would I want to come home? And that's what I convinced myself of. So that's how I justify, minimize, and rationalize to myself. And um, so that was a rocky relationship. And then we broke up, and we were broke up for a couple months, and she had pity on me because I called crying, Christmas time, I'm alone, oh, boo-hoo, I'm the only one at the Chinese food restaurant drinking tonight. Oh, oh, well, come to the house. And, like, I had helped raise her daughter for a few years at that point. And she was like, you know, Corey would love to have you here. You know, and then so she gave me some pity sex, and uh, I begged and begged and 
put a hundred dollar bill on the bed and you know, she, she caved. And, uh, then I went about living my life and three months later, like I hadn't talked to her in three months and I'm out drinking at lunchtime with, with a couple guys I work with and, uh, my pager goes off and I'm like, why would Michelle be calling me? He's like, dude, she's probably pregnant. I'm like, dude, that ain't funny. And I'm like, give me a double shot of Cuervo. Boom, hit that down, go over to the pay phone. I didn't have a cell phone at, the, you know, at, at this time. I was in between cell phones because I was rough on those things. They were pretty expensive at the time. And uh, so I call her up so she could tell me she was pregnant. And uh, I was just like, well, because I thought I finally got rid of her from my life, I thought she was the problem. And my life was quickly spiraling out of control, but I couldn't see it because I didn't have her to help me to see it. And, uh, you know, but I was so excited because my dad was my hero. And aside from him going being in prison, aside of the time that he spent, spent in prison, like, I didn't really understand that he wasn't there a lot. But he was my hero. But I did know that I wanted it be, to be more between us. And, all I ever wanted from like a young teenager was to be the dad that I thought he was, the dad that he was that was good, and the dad that I always wished he could be. And I wanted to have a son and do that. And uh, so I was really excited. And um, I had my our whole life together planned out. And um, not for once considering any of her life plans. And um, you know, a couple of people have heard this part of my story. Uh, you know, to me, this shows the selfishness and self-centeredness. And, uh, you know, somebody once helped me to see that, like, I can't see the picture from within the frame. I can't see past myself to see anybody else. And um, right to the point, like, um, the night he was born, she called me. She was going. I told her I was just still down the Cape. I was 45 minutes from home. I was just wrapping up on the job. Like, I'll meet you at the hospital. Have somebody take you. And like, I was literally like a mile from the house at the bar. And I planned on finishing my drink and heading up there. And then I was like, well, I don't want to get there too soon because I just told her I was 45 minutes away. So I'm going to leave here in 45 minutes and go over there. And that was sometime in the late afternoon. And uh, I got there at like 10.30 at night, and she was very upset, very angry. And uh, I said, did you have him yet? And she said, no. I said, what's the big deal? Like, not that she had been sitting there in labor screaming and writhing in pain for the last five hours alone. No, she hadn't had him yet, so what's the big deal? I'm here now. I'll be here when he's born. And he was born and something didn't seem right. And, um, you know, one thing led to another. They go to hand him to me. And um, they hand it to me. I look at him. Something just doesn't seem right. He looks a little off. And, um, you know, the doctor says to me, we have to, we'll have we have to confirm this, um, you know, tomorrow. But, uh, you know, it appears that your son has Down syndrome. And I don't know what the hell that is. Well, but there was this TV show, Life Goes On, with this actor on it, Corky, and I knew he had Down syndrome. And he was cool, but he wasn't normal, and the whole life that I had dreamed up for me and my son, like, was shattered in an instant. And, uh, you know, I show up five hours late. What's your, what's your problem? Like, I'm here. You didn't have him yet. And then they hand it to me, and they tell me he has Down syndrome, and I hand him to her, and I walk out. Because my whole world is shattered. Could not see for one moment that maybe her world was. And I go out, have a couple pops out at the truck, and and you know what I mean? I regain my composure. I come in like 15, 20 minutes later, and uh, she's so angry. And I'm like, I just had to clear my head. Like, my whole world was shattered. What are you complaining about? You have a normal daughter. As if it wasn't her son. As if she hadn't just been had this news laid on her. And, um, you know, I wrote, I wrote that one for a while, you know what I mean? Because nobody, nobody had a problem with how, how much I was partying after, for a while after that. And um, what a blessing that he was born with Down syndrome. What a blessing. Because he had no idea the life I subjected him to. He was just happy to be with his dad. 
He was always happy to be with his dad, my sidekick. I even stopped drinking in bars for that kid. I didn't slow, I didn't drink any less. I probably drank more and did a lot of other things. And I, but I brought him with me everywhere I went. He was my sidekick. He had no idea the situations I put him in, the danger I put him in, the people I surrounded him with. If he, if he didn't have Down syndrome, I, I can't imagine who he would have turned out to be. You know, he's the happiest, one of the happiest guys in the world. And I'll get back to him later and, um, in a couple, for a couple other scenarios. Um, well, actually, I'll, I'll use him to illustrate more of my powerlessness. So he became my home world. I just told you, I even altered the way I partied before him because it was so important for him to be with me. And, and you know, because he was everything to me. And he, I did everything, everything, everything with that kid. And he was the one thing that I swore to myself that I will never allow booze or drugs to stand between me and him. Never. And you couldn't have convinced me otherwise. No. And then over time, this disease progressed. And I began to become less and less present in his life. And I began to not show up when he was told that I was coming, because me and her had split again. And I began to not show up when, when, I, when he was waiting for me. Just every noise outside, da-da, 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 da-da. And she would call me and, like, put me on speakerphone and hear, let me hear him. Da-da, 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 me, you, da-da, me, you, da-da. You know? And meanwhile, like, you know, I'm hunched over somebody's coffee table somewhere. You know? Pouring bottles of booze down my throat. Crying because I can't be there and I want to. And he was the world to me. The most important thing in the world to me. I would have gave my life for him in a split second. You know? Then she started keeping him from me. And she would take him from me. It would be one thing for me not to show up. I would feel horrible, and I would, and I would drink that away. And then she started taking him from me and saying, you'll never see your son again if you don't get your, get your life together. And I would tighten up, and I would tell her I was doing the right thing and tell her I was sober, and I wasn't. And the truth always came out. I would get him back into my life, and any kind of control I managed to pull together to get him back in my life went right out the window the minute I got him back. And that happened many times, many times. And then um, <clears throat> in 2006, um, I ran over a 14-year-old girl in a blackout. Um, grace of God, she was okay. She survived. Well, they didn't know that. They had ALF because she was bleeding from her head. And um, <clears throat> apparently, so the police report says, you know what I mean, I fled to the other side of town where I rear-ended the intern for the head of the South Shore Drug Task Force. And they chased me around until the cops caught up with me and found me. And um, I had been arrested in the town that I lived in, like, countless times. <clears throat> I knew them by first name. They knew me by first name. And um, they were too lenient with me, way too lenient. I would fall out of my truck onto the ground with my son sitting in the truck with me, and they would say, have somebody come get him, and if this truck moves from this spot before the sun rises, I will come arrest you. And I'm talking dozens upon dozens upon dozens of times. They were way too lenient with me. I got arrested for fighting a lot. They never charged me. They would keep me overnight. And in the morning, they would always ask me. They would come to me in the cell and ask me, like, are you ready to behave yourself? Yeah. All right. And they would let me go. And <clears throat> I woke up that morning, very familiar with the cell that I was in, knew where I was, no idea why I was there, like, Went to stand up. My leg was kind of like, I kind of went down. My leg was kind of hurt. And I was like, oh, I must have gotten out of the fight. You know, and I yell out for the chief. I'm like, Sully. You know, and he comes down, and he's got this somber look on his face. You know, and I'm waiting for his, his little jokes that he's always cracking. <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. He says, uh, I can't help you this time, Danny. You know, and I tended to, in order to show people how, you know, because I was so afraid of what people thought of me, what I thought people thought of me, you know, I made it a habit of going after the biggest guys that I could find. And if I didn't have any kind of confidence that I would win, I would grab a pool stick or a beer bottle or something. And when he, the way he said that, I was like, I killed somebody. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Like, I'm going to prison for the rest of my life. I can see, I know it. And um, I said, what happened? And he said, you don't remember? And I said, no, I have no recollection whatsoever. 
And he said, you ran over a 14-year-old girl last night. And I crumbled to the ground in tears. Oh. I was devastated. I couldn't believe that I had done that. And they set the bill very high. Was in a position to get bailed out. They could have set the bill at $500, and I couldn't have got bailed out at this point in my life. Oh. The people in my life were done bailing me out. There was nobody to call. There was nobody to call to tell I was in jail. Nobody. They found, my family and friends found out when I was plastered all over the TV on the news, come arraignment Monday morning, repeat drunk driver, runs over a 14 year old girl. And, uh, that's how my family found out. With people, and with my mother and her husband, with the pastor, or their, Protestant, whatever the pastor or priest, whoever from the, from the Protestant church, at their house for dinner. And that's how they found out. And uh, there was nobody to call. And for six months, once I got tra- put in county jail, for six months, I called ten times a day, collect call to everybody I could think, and nobody would take my calls. Oh, and then finally on my son's birthday, his mother couldn't take him asking anymore, and she brought him up to visit me. And he's nonverbal. He says a lot, but, you know, it's not understandable. And, uh, you know, she brought him up. He had to visit me through the one-inch thick glass for the telephone. And I don't understand. I don't know one word other than Dutter and me that he said. You know, and then it was time to go. And, like, I had to go this way and he had to go that way. And, and I heard this hellacious banging noise. And I turned around. And he was smashing himself in the face with the phone. And he was screaming so loud that blood vessels were popping all over his face that I could see from five feet away. And uh, that was the most emotional pain I ever felt in my life. The book talks about we can't bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. It talks about sometimes the consequences don't cloud in. I never had a problem remembering what the consequences were. You know, the, conse- the internal or the external consequences that brought me to a place where I will never do this again. The problem is I can't bring into my consciousness with sufficient force the suffering and humiliation. I couldn't bring into my consciousness with sufficient force what it felt like that day, watching him smash himself in the face and me not being able to help. What it was like to not have anybody take my collect calls for those six months. And when I got out of jail for that, like I was never, ever touching anything ever again as long as I lived. And you couldn't convince me otherwise. And that was the longest I ever stayed sober outside of jail of treatment. And three three months after I got out, I was fishing. We came in from just a regular trip, did what we did after every trip. We went across the street to the bar, pub, bar, whatever, um, steak dinner. I ordered my steak dinner like I do every time. You know, bring me a glass of milk and a frosty mug when it comes. I like my milk cold. And he went through the swinging doors, and it seemed like an eternity went by. And he came back through, and I was like Budweiser and shot a Cuervo. And everybody that I was there with was mortified. Like, everything you've been telling us for the last three months, everything that you've gone through, everything that this has done to your life, like, you're really going to drink right now? And I'm like, you know, we're unloading in the morning. Like, it's 1030 at night. Like, there's only a few hours till the last call. Like, I'm only having a couple. It's no big deal. You know, and then the next thing I remember was they were refusing to give me a third last call at some other place. Uh, so I drank a whole big tray full of leftover drinks. And then the next thing I remember, I was wandering the streets of downtown Boston at 330 in the morning looking for something else. You know, and once began, and once be, not once, hence began one more trip to the asylum, to treatment. You know, and my life began to spiral hellaciously out of control at that point. And, uh, my son was removed from my life permanently. Um, I began to see, it brought me to my knees, my surrender. I got, I gave up the need to be right. I gave up the need to have the plan. I didn't have a plan. I couldn't be me for one more minute. Because all those other things that I mentioned during my story, those were all, those were all clearly bottoms. No. But like our friend Peter likes to say, bottoms have trap doors and trap doors have trap doors. And that's been my experience. It was when I couldn't be me for one more second in here that I was surrendered. Because I didn't think it was a good idea. I didn't want to get sober. I wanted to feel okay. I wanted to be able to look at the guy in the mirror. I wanted to stop wishing that I wouldn't have to live another day. I wanted to stop wishing that I was dead. 
I wanted to stop hurting the people that I loved. And I was incapable. The hotter I tried, the worse I made it. I was incapable. My power had filled me utterly. And I was not okay with this higher power God thing. You can call it anything you want. I know you're talking about God. (laughs) Talk to to the hand because the head ain't listening. You know what I mean? Like... I was almost physically violent with some people in meetings my first couple of months. Um, you know, but somebody helped me to look at all these things, all the stuff that I mentioned during my story, all the opportunities in my life that, that, that I sacrificed for booze, you know, my son, my relationships, you know, and so many more things I didn't have time to talk about. All of those things, somebody helped me to look at them, and somebody used my experiences against me because I wasn't having it. And I looked at everything that I had ever tried to turn my life around for, everything that I had ever tried to put the booze down for, everything that I had ever tried to keep the booze down for. And he said, out of all those things, what was the most important thing in the world to you? I didn't have to think about that. My son. He said, were you able to? I said, no. He said, when you made the commitment to yourself and nobody else was listening, were you able to stay stopped? No. He said, well, I don't want to rain on your parade, but those are all forms of human power. So unless you're going to come up with something more important to you than the most important thing in the world, it looks to me like you're screwed. And I, and I often use the analogy. See, it talks about circumstances made us willing. No. It wasn't until I was completely convinced that my power and any other power on the face of the earth was insufficient and f- had already failed me utterly, that circumstances made me willing. And I use the analogy, when the cops put the handcuffs on me, I'm willing to get in the back of the cruiser. And what made me willing to get in the back of a cruiser? Several times of not getting in the back of a cruiser. Right? So several times of trying to get sober on my own power and using all these forms of human power to motivate me and to give me the power to do it because of how important they were to me, and then suffering the beatdown from that billy club of life, of alcoholism. Circumstances made me willing. I didn't want to believe. I thought willing had to be desire. I had no desire whatsoever to believe. But just like when the handcuffs are on, like I felt like I had no other choice. Because, only because somebody helped me to look at my own personal experiences that proved to me beyond a shadow of a doubt that lack of power was my dilemma. And that I was beyond human aid. Mm-hmm. Because I wasn't buying what, they, what you guys were selling. No. If this solves your problem, you clearly don't suffer from what I suffer from. And that's how I felt, and I was convinced of it. Like, might work for you. Ain't going to work for a guy like me. Like, not going to be the answer. You know, in spite of me, you know. And after a few fourth steps, you know, I finally was able to see that picture. I was finally able to understand why she was so hurt in that, in, in that delivery room. I was finally able to see where I set the ball rolling in life where I had made decisions based on self to put myself in the position to be hurt. See, because I was so angry with her for 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 leaving me and taking my son from me, not from me, from me at the time, because she was so angry about that hospital room that I couldn't see that 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 I made the decisions to put me in the position to be hurt. And my life began to go under a transformation. And people started pointing it out to me. And I'll be honest with you, I was embarrassed. Because I'm a street guy. I was embarrassed by the transformation that was happening. But I started to feel good in my heart. I started to be able to look in the mirror again. I started to be able to, I started to feel happy. Damn it. I'll finish up with an amends story. Um, Well, for starters, like, most of the people that I harmed, I harmed repeatedly for years. And they weren't hearing it. They'd heard how I was living life different, how I was doing the right thing. So some of them took a little time of, of, you know, my actions speaking so loud that those people that absorbed the shock of my alcoholism didn't have to hear a word I was saying because my words were meaningless. Because I had a PhD and I'm sorry. You know, it took two years for my, for my stepmother to give me the opportunity. And it's been six and a half years without my son in my life. 
And he's tried to reach out to me several times, and his mother always cuts it off at the knees. And uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, I've tried to reach out to her directly, third party, you know, asking for an opportunity to make amends, not asking, tell, making it clear that it wasn't about my son, that I just wanted to make amends to her, and I, I wanted her to know how wrong I realized I've been. You know, I wasn't saying I was sorry, and uh, he video chatted with me. Somehow or another, he got unblocked, and he video chatted with me a few weeks ago. And... Uh, I was messaging with him, and all of a sudden, what's up with a question mark? Way too advanced for him. And I was like, oh. And uh, so I said something else, and uh, and she said, like, you left. Stay out of his life. Stay gone. Die. And uh, I was waiting for it. I expected it. You know, I don't blame her one bit today. Like, she is justified. Justified. And I can't get an opportunity to make a direct amends to her. So I prayed about it. And the least desirable form of amends that I can think of would be through messenger. You know? But that's the only opportunity, that's the only opportunity I've had in over five years of, of wanting to and asking to. And so I wrote a real long message you know, about how wrong that I was. And how I can see so many different ways, and I listed so many different ways that I had harmed her. And that I can't imagine how many other ways I've harmed her. And that I'm not seeking forgiveness, nor do I expect it, nor do I think she should. I just want her to know how wrong that I know I've been. And for what it's worth, from the bottom of my heart, I'm sorry. And five minutes later, my son video chatted with me, and I've been video chatting with him for the last two weeks straight on almost a daily basis. Don't talk to me what God, talk to me about what God can't do. That's the shit this pro, that's the stuff this program does. That's the transformation that it brings about within us. And the blessings that it brings down on us through God's grace. And you can beat up Mike Chase in the parking lot afterwards for bringing me in. Thanks for letting me share. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.